Tonight, I am very pleased to introduce Peter Pomerantsev. Peter is a TV producer and a nonfiction writer. Uh, his articles appeared in the Atlantic Mo Monthly, Daily Beast, London Review of Books, Newsweek, and other publications. He has also worked as a consultant for the EU and the think tanks for projects um, focusing on the former Soviet Union. He started going to Russia regularly as a reality TV producer almost a decade ago, and re the result is the book called Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, uh, in which Peter calls Russia a vast scripted reality show and a postmodern dictatorship. Um, the book at time reads like almost an absurdist novel in that you get ridiculous, unbelievable things, and yet they are the reality in the new Russia. Um, I personally left Russia in 1997, so I actually missed the 21st century version of it. Um, but I was there through the years that led up to it, and nothing is true reminded me of why my father was so eager to leave the country, <laughs> because he thought he could not be both successful and honest business owner. And uh, so I found that book sadly quite believable and also very astute in its observations. And I hope you enjoy the talk and pick up the copy. And now please join me in welcoming Peter Pomerantsev to Politics and Prose. Oh, thank you so much for coming. It means so much when uh, you know people react this way and uh, I'm very touched and honored that you're here. Um, you're kind of my guinea pigs. This is my first, um, my first little talk um, as I get going on my great international tour of, of sort of bookshops and coffee shops around the world. So so just on the taxi here, I realized how I wanted to do this. Um, so I'm going to test it out on you. It's very, very rough. It's what we in TV call a rough cut. And then maybe at the end, you can tell me how I can, um, you know, get this better by the time I meet the really serious readers at the Harvard bookstore. Um, so listen, when I started to pitch this book, it's a weird book. Um, and I noticed it's been, you know, a few people have reviewed it. And, and uh, I ended up thinking, my God, this isn't, you know, whenever they review it, uh, I was like, that's not what I had in mind at all. So I'm actually going to tell you what I thought the book would, was about. <laughs> and then, uh, and I'm quite happy for you to have completely other interpretations. So when I came to Faber, who were the original publishers in London, to sell this book, the way I pitched it was, um, you know, Russia, contemporary Russia, la la la. But um, it's a mixture of um, sort of uh, Christopher Isherwood's um, stories about Berlin uh, in the 1930s, that kind of sort of treatment of character and that kind of way to understand a society through, through normal people that you meet. But with also a bit of Michael Lewis's first book. But, but instead of working behind the scenes in a sort of a, a horrible investment company, I worked behind the scenes in a horrible propaganda machine. Um, uh, so yeah, as, as, uh, as uh, the, the host mentioned, I, I, I worked, uh, I came to Russia at the start of the Putin era in 2001 and ended up working in inside the television machine, which I think now with the war in Ukraine, everyone now realizes that uh, Russian television is far more than simply television. This is actually, it's now turned, you know, maybe even a weapon of some sort. But back then, nobody realized that Russian propaganda was going to be this huge phenomenon. So I'll just read you, I'm going to read a little bit of the book, just to sort of talk you through it. Uh, read, to read a bit about my first meeting in uh, sort of the headquarters of Russian TV, which is now the place which is the headquarters of Russia's global propaganda. So my first meeting took me to the top floor of Ostankino, the television center the size of five football fields that is the battering ram of Kremlin propaganda. On the top floor, down a series of matte black corridors, is a long conference room. Here, Moscow's flashiest minds met for the weekly brainstorming session to decide what Ostankino would broadcast. I was taken along by a friendly Russian publisher. Due to my Russian surname, no one had noticed I was British. I kept my mouth shut. There were more than 20 of us in the room, tan broadcasters in white silk shirts and politics professors with sweaty beards and heavy breath and ad execs and trainers. There were no women. Everyone was smoking. There was so much smoke it made my skin itch. At the end of the table sat one of the country's most famous political TV presenters, Mikhail Leontiev, just for the people who know who that is. Uh, he's now the, um, he's now the, uh, um, the head of PR at uh, Rosneft. Uh, he is small and speaks fast with a smoky voice. I'm not going to try to do a silly Russian accent. None of that. We all know there will be no real politics. This is him talking. But we still have to give our viewers the sense something is happening. They need to, they need to be kept entertained. So what should we play with? Should we attack oligarchs? Who's the enemy this week? Politics has got to feel like a movie. 
So the first thing the President Putin had done when he came to power in 2000 was to seize control of television. It was television through which the Kremlin decided which politicians would allow as its puppet opposition what the country's history and fears and consciousness should be. And the new Kremlin won't make the same mistake the old Soviet Union did. It will never let TV become dull. The task is to synthesize Soviet control with Western entertainment. 21st century Stankino mixes show business and propaganda ratings with authoritarianism. And at the center of this great show is the president himself, created from a no one, a grey fuzz by the, by the power of television, so that he morphs as rapidly as a performance artist among his role among his roles of soldier, lover, bare-chested hunter, businessman, spy, tsar, superman. The news is the incense by which we bless Putin's actions, make him the president's. TV producers and political technologists like to say. Sitting in that smoky room, I had the sense that reality was somehow malleable, that I was with Prosperos who could project any existence they wanted onto post-Soviet Russia. That's the longest extract I'm going to do. Um, so, I mean, it sounds like, and it sometimes is, it sounds like a sort of a, a Chomskyan vision of Western media, but in Russia it's real, not a fantasy. Um, it's almost sometimes I feel as if they've left, they've, they've read some sort of like a sort of very, very lefty criticism of Western media. Imagine if it was all controlled by the Pentagon and have made it real in Russia. Um, every week, sort of the heads of Russian TV channels would literally be called in for a conversation about, you know, what language they should use, who the opposition were. The whole sort of circus uh, of Russian politics was incredibly choreographed in the center. The whole of society was like a reality show, essentially. Um, but at the same time, you know, the, the device of the book, sort of the narrative thrust is my working in this, in this odd world. Uh, but that's not really the theme. The, the underlying theme is, 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 I suppose, what you could call Russia's sort of true ideology, not, not the articulated ideology, which was communism in the 1980s, which no one believed in, democracy in the 1990s, which no one believed in, and now uh, national religious um, anti-gay something or other, which again, nobody believes in. It's one of the most atheist countries in the world. Um, so, so and right at the start, I try to, I wouldn't call it an ideology, it's more a mindset and, and that I'm trying to get to. Um, and so here's my first sort of impressions of it when I arrive in 2000. Performance was the city's buzzword. A world where gangsters become artists, gold diggers quote Pushkin, hell's angels hallucinate, the, hallucinate themselves as saints. Russia had seen so many worlds flick through in such blistering progression, from communism to perestroika to shock therapy to penury to oligarchy to mafia state to mega rich, that its new heroes were left with the sense that life is just one glittering masquerade, where every role in any position or belief is mutable. I want to try on every persona the world has ever known, Vladik Mamashov Monroe would tell me. He was a performance artist and the city's mascot. The inevitable guest at parties attended by the inevitable tycoons and supermodels, arriving dressed as Gorbachev, a fake Tusuk Hamu and the Russian president. When I first landed in Moscow, I thought these infinite transformations, the expression of a country liberated, pulling on different costumes in a frenzy of freedom, pushing the limits of personality as far as it could possibly go to what the president's vizier would call the heights of creation. It was only years later that I came to see these endless mutations not as freedom, but as forms of delirium, in which scare puppets and nightmare mystics become convinced they're almost real and march towards what the president's vizier would go on to call the Fifth World War, the first non-linear war of all against all, which is a description by Vladislav Surkov, who's sort of the eminence grees of Russian politics of the current war around Ukraine. Um, so I started working in Russian TV. And in the book, I am... Um, what I try to do, I try to pull off this trick. I try to show the kind of uh, the progression of Russian society from from, from decadence to madness, from uh, glamour to fascism. I mean, very much the issue with pattern in his Berlin stories, um, uh, but through sort of the people that I meet. Um, so at, one of the first characters we meet is is a gold digger. Um, uh, her name's Olyona. She's a star of a TV show I'm making about how to marry a millionaire. Uh, and I was very, very worried about making this my first sort of hero in the book because you know, all the cliches, Russian prostitutes, all this, it's, it's awful. Uh, I really didn't want to repeat that. And at the same time, the gold again was a social archetype. And this is something that, you know, the book teeters on between stereotype and archetype. And a, a, a great debate I had with myself as I was writing it, is this an archetype who represents society or is this a, you know, a lazy stereotype? Hopefully I get it right. I don't know. It's, it, was, it was something that I was very worried about. So, but why did I choose this gold digger? I mean, she expressed the underlying ideology of the society. She, she, she wasn't just about money. Um, she really had uh, an idea of the self. And her idea was to, cut, to transform herself for every man she meets, uh, to sort of be different for every man. So she'd be a, 
um, a horrible bitch for one, a sort of an angel for another. She would analyze the men. She went to a special gold digging school where they would teach them, where they would teach them seriously. They're, they're called sort of geisha schools in Russia. They're, quite, they're very popular. Uh, they, they would teach them never, you know, never wear anything on a first date. I mean, never wear, I mean, wear clothes, never wear anything sort of, never wear any jewelry, but wear very simple clothes. You have to listen to the man and transform yourself in line with his desires. You know, you have to uh, attempt to analyze what, what, what he wants. And, and you know, she, she would, uh, at one point when I was sort of, you know, filming her, she fell in love with this guy who, who loved Pushkin, so she'd learn lots of Pushkin off by heart in order to impress him. But then she would actually get increasingly lost among all these various roles she played. And you could sort of see where the society, sort of in her little story, I try to sort of reflect where society would get to much later when, as I think it has now, it's sort of lost track of reality and, and lost track of who it was. Um, so on the one hand, you had someone like Alyona right at the bottom of society um, um, who had this kind of... Um, maybe I'll read you a little bit about her, actually. No, I wasn't going to. Should I read a bit about her? Because it was all about me trying to understand her and trying to... Uh, um, trying to... Um, um, trying, to uh, trying to understand her psychology. And at one point, I realized that she'd actually been, been raped. Um, very violently back in her hometown in Donetsk. Um, mass sort of gang raped over a series of days. And I was like, oh my God, this is terrible. I'm so sorry I mentioned, you know, I didn't mean to bring this up in the interview. And, and her answer was like, oh, it's normal. It happens to all the girls, no biggie. Um, and then um, um, and then I sort of try to kind of understand her. Um, hold on, let me just find it. Uh, this is her talking about, about, about sort of the rape. This isn't said de dejectedly, but is always softly detached, like she thinks about herself in the third person. Whenever I look for a vein of sadness in Oliana, it, it melts away. As a director, it's my job to catch her out, find a chink, pull the emotional lever where her facade crumbles and she breaks and cries. But she just turns and twists and smiles and shimmers with every colour. She's not scared of poverty, humiliation. If she loses her sponsor, she'll just start again, reinvent herself and press reload. So she was really a realization of this, uh, this ideology, of this, this idea of the personality that could endlessly transform. So at the bottom of society, you had someone like Alyona. At the top, you had uh, Vladislav Surkov, who was um, the vice head of the presidential administration. Um, he was sort of the man who ran the Russian political system uh, for a long time. He was the one who would uh, you know, run all the TV channels, run all the political parties. For a while later, he fell out of grace. Now he's back in and he's essentially running the sort of the theater around uh, the Donbass and in Crimea. So he's the guy who kind of like designed the referendum, designed that Aksyonov would be head of Crimea. He's the one who put Borodai there to uh, run the Donbass rebellion. I don't know if you know the people I'm talking about. This is all the sort of the visual side as opposed to the military side of what we're seeing in Crimea and Ukraine. He's the kind of the great reality show producer who runs Russian politics. Um, and so here's a, big, a brief description uh, of what he did. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that whether it's Alyona at the bottom or Circle at the top, they're both reflecting one kind of uh, one mindset. Hello, William. How are you doing? Let me see. Um, um, so. Uh, in the 21st century, the techniques of the political technologists have become centralized and systematized, coordinated out of the office of the presidential administration, where Surkov would sit behind a desk on which were phones bearing the names of all the ind independent party leaders, calling and directing them at any moment, day or night. The brilliance of this new type of authoritarianism is that instead of simply oppressing opposition, as had been the case with 20th century strains, it climbs inside all ideologies and movements, exploiting and rendering them absurd. One moment Surkov would fund civic forums and human rights NGOs, the next he would, he would quietly support nationalist movements that accuse the NGOs of being tools of the West. With a flourish, he sponsors... He sponsored lavish arts festivals for the most provocative modern artists in Moscow, then supported orthodox fundamentalists dressed all in black and carrying crosses who in turn attacked the modern art exhibitions. The Kremlin's idea is to own all forms of political discourse, to not let any independent movements develop outside its walls. Its Moscow can feel like an oligarchy in the morning and a democracy in the afternoon, a monarchy for dinner and a totalitarian state by bedtime. So, I mean, one of the most interesting things about Surkov is that he not only did this, he would kind of and he still does. He sort of writes about it. He also writes novels in his spare time. They're sort of very sort of uh, um, sort of arty postmodern novels about sort of how dark and messed up Russia is. His first one and his best one was called Almost Zero, and it's semi-autobiographical. I mean, it's a satirical, it's a satirical surrealist book, but the the hero is clearly based on him. Um, um, Surkov was a he was sort of like a bohemian aesthete in Soviet times, then became a PR man, then became a politician. Uh, the hero follows a very similar trajectory. And so what's interesting is, is that it's, it's that very rare case where, you know, imagine you had, 
Goebbels writing sort of, uh, which he kind of did, uh, r r writing um, um, sort of novels about himself to describe the inner world that he experiences. So what's interesting, I about, he, he gives us a little insight into how s somebody in the elite works. So I'm going to read a passage from his book um, describing his alter ego, but I think one can apply it back to himself. His self was locked in a nutshell. Outside were his shadows, dolls. He saw himself as almost autistic, imit imitating contact with the outside world, talking to others in false voices to fish out whatever he needed from the Moscow school. Books, sex, money, food, power, and other useful things. And this is me trying to understand this hero. Yegor is a manip... That's the name of Surkov's hero. Yegor is a manipulator, but not a Nicholas. He has a very clear conception of the divine. And this, I think, is one of the key sort of passages in, to understand sort of contemporary Russia. Yegor could clearly see the heights of creation, where in a blinding abyss, frolic, non-corporeal, unpiloted, pathless words, free beings joining and dividing and merging to create beautiful patterns. So this is the head of the Russian political system describing his, his alter ego in a novel. The heights of creation, Yegor's God is beyond good and evil, and Yegor is his privileged companion, too clever to care for anyone, too close to, to God to need morality. He sees the world as a space in which to project different realities. Surkov articulates the underlying philosophy of the new elite, a generation of post-Soviet supermen who are stronger, more clear-headed, faster and more flexible than anyone that has come before. Uh, and then I go on to talk about how I see this sort of mentality reflected in sort of my peers, the TV producers who, who make sort of awful propaganda stuff in the morning and then holiday in Tusc Tuscany during summer. So meanwhile, the producers who work at the Astankino channels or at Russia Today might all be liberals in their private lives, holiday in Tuscany and be completely European in their tastes. When I ask how they marry their professional and personal lives, they look at me as if I were a fool and answer, over the last 20 years, we've lived through a communism we never believed in, democracy and default and mafia state and oligarchy, and we've realized they are illusions, that everything is PR. Everything is PR. This has become the favorite phrase of the new Russia. My Moscow peers are filled with a sense that they are both cynical and enlightened. When I ask them about Soviet-era dissidents like my parents, by the way, I forgot to mention, my, well, I have Soviet background, but my family left in the 70s. When I asked them about Soviet-era dissidents like my parents who fought against communism, they dismissed them as naive dreamers and my own Western attachment to such vague notions as human rights, freedom as a blunder. Can't you see your own governments are just as bad as ours, they asked me. I try to protest, but they just smile and pity me. To believe in something and stand by it in this world is derided. The ability to be a shapeshifter celebrated. Vladimir Nabokov once described a species of butterfly that in an early stage in its development had to learn how to change colors to hide from predators. The butterfly's predators had long died off, but still it changed its colors from the sheer pleasure of transformation. Something similar has happened to the Russian elites. During the Soviet period, they learned to dissimulate in order to survive. Now there is no need to constantly change their colors, but they continue to do so out of a dark joy, conformism raised to the level of aesthetic act. So this is kind of the world I found myself in. Um, and the first part of the book is really an introduction into this world and how it's reflected both in the power strategies and in the sort of the daily sort of social existence. But obviously, this system is not particularly sustainable. Uh, so if you read the book, as it goes on, uh, we get to see the sort of the dark side, the flip side um, of... of um, of this world. So, I mean, essentially this world is an illusion. It's a, it's a, it's a simulacra, this world that Surkov has created. So one of my main heroes, as the book gets darker, is a, a businesswoman uh, called uh, Jana Yakovleva, who had this wonderful middle-class existence, um, you know, lived like, a, like any, any of you live, uh, but more privileged. She was a millionaire. She was a self-made businesswoman, sort of a, a hero of the new Russia. Um, and, and if anything, sort of that Western lifestyle has, has a much more sort of sharper taste in, in Russia because it's all new and fresh and you feel, you've, you know, feel you're discovering lattes and, and, and tagliatelle for the first time. Um, and, uh, but then one day that life sort of gets ripped away um, and basically someone turns up and says you're under arrest. Um, and she doesn't understand why. She's literally hauled out of her privileged existence, put into a prison. And, and it's, it's one of my favorite chapters in the book where, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, ex exiting a dream world and she could never tell whether the dream world was the sort of, uh, uh, was the illusion that she'd been living in or, or, or the hell that she'd been plunged into. I mean, uh, it's funny, I mean, Solzhenitsyn would talk about it in exactly the same way at the start of uh, the Gulag Archipelago, that, that, that these hands can just grab you and put you in a gulag. Uh, that hasn't gone away. Um, uh, and so increasingly as the book goes on, we begin to see the flip side of this, of this weird and wonderful and menacing world that, that uh, Putin and, and his co coterie have, um, cohorts have, uh, have created. Um, 
And 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 there are several sort of flip sides. I mean, one of them is is the obvious one, which is that uh, you know. Uh, behind the sort of uh, the reality show of the politics, there's you know, mass corruption and uh, um, a very brutal power system that takes other people's businesses away uh, away at will, uh, like in Yana's case. But there's also a psychological flip side. So there's a psychological flip side to this ideology of endless transformation. And, and, and put very simply, it's despair. Um, because a very interesting statistic in Russia, even it was, as it was getting richer and richer, the suicide rates, especially among young people, was growing. Um, uh, and I ended up making a series of films about young people and suicide. And, and their great problem was they didn't have material problems. They weren't drinking themselves to death. This was a problem in the 90s. The problem was they had no stable ideology during their sort of, you know, maturation periods. So when they were in their, you know, 20s and sort of the, the, the classical age when, when people break and commit suicide. Um, uh, you know, sociologists have looked at this phenomenon and generally there is a suicide spike when a society has a sort of an ideological break. So parents have nothing to pass on to their children. So Sweden, the famous Swedish statistic that Sweden has high suicide rates, not because it's dark. You know, Norway's next door, low suicide rates. It was because Sweden went from a, a, a one very conservative religious social system to a sort of, sort of you know, quasi-socialist one. And in that gap, um, there was a suicide spike. So, so it's not because of sunlight. But in Russia, this was sort of, uh, and the whole form of uh, Soviet Union, this was a huge problem. Because obviously, if the ideology that you're selling is cynicism, is this, you know, radical relativism, which is almost like a perverse version of postmodernism, which is what Surkov was kind of peddling and how this whole society was built, um, you know, people have absolutely no center with which to root themselves in. So those are the two things that I look at. But the uh, you know this this system was only sustainable while you know the Kremlin could also pay people off you know there was a, a very simple sort of uh, money deal and the reason that I was in Russia was was because the television industry was booming there was the oil boom as that money slowed down after two thousand eight there was less money to um, you know pay off society. It, um, and you saw the first kind of revolts happening on the streets. This was way before 2011, 2012, already 2008, 2009. Um, there would be sort of these anti-fascists and anarchists suddenly sort of charging down the streets of, of Moscow, calling for a different government. It, it bubbled for a long time. In the end, it sort of had its expression in 2012 with the big protests against Putin. So I would find myself back in, back meeting sort of uh, these great Prosperos, the political uh, technologists and TV producers who run Russia and the conversations were pretty honest. They were like, people are angry, we have a crisis on, we need to do something with it through the power of television. And there was pretty much a conscious decision made, we need to do stuff about mysticism, conspiracies, we need to break down critical language. I don't, I'd never heard anyone say, we've got to break down critical language, but it was like, let's do mysticism, conspiracies, no social themes. Let's go that way. Let's just talk about spirituality to get away from social problems. This was a very much a conscious decision. This had also been practiced sort of in the early 1990s. There's been a spate uh, of, of sort of uh, mystics and healers that were put on television as early as 1989, very, very consciously uh, by the sort of fading Soviet powers and the other people coming in to kind of keep the country calm while the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, the most famous was a guy called Kasperovsky who would sort of uh, sit in 1989, sort of staring through the screen going, you are all feeling better. You're all feeling much better. No, but the whole country would, would you know, would, would watch this. And uh, his most famous thing was like, put a glass of water onto the table. By the end of the program, the water will be full of rays and it will be holy water and you can cure cancer and alcoholism and all this stuff. People believed it. Um, so now Kasparovsky gets brought back. This was all pushed away in the 2000s. You know, the Russians were making sort of reality shows. They made the, the Russian version of The Apprentice, uh, X Factor, talent shows. Suddenly it was like, bring the freaks back. Uh, so Kasparovsky was brought back in a slightly watered down version, but was nothing as impressive as it used to be because by this time, Russian TV producers were really experimenting with, with new forms of, of psychological manipulation. So they were obsessed with neuro-linguistic neuro programming, NLP. This was a big deal here in the 1960s. It's a very, very dodgy pseudoscience, um, which says that by repeating certain key words, you can sort of hypnotize the audience. So they were really into this. So, so the head producer of Channel One, this is recorded? Okay, I might get sued, who cares? Um, uh, I think he's sanctioned anyway. Um, so uh, was, would literally go like, I want on minute three of our morning broadcast to be this word, morning minute five to be this word. They were obsessed with this idea of using language to literally hypnotize uh, the audience. You have to say the word enemy 10 times during a show. I don't know whether all this works. This is the thing about these pseudosciences, but that was the way they were thinking. 
And, and if you sort of look in totality of the way television became, there was like a pattern to it, which is very much like the behavior of, of certain sects. So there would be conspiracy theories nonstop, not just about Americans are here to take over Russia, but conspiracy theories about everything. M m crazy fungi were taking over Russia. Um, um, the, the KGB had sleepers that could see inside your soul and inside Bush's soul, so you better know that we're watching you. Nonstop conspiracy as a genre. Um, which, you know, the end effect of that is just start to break down critical thinking, to break down any kind of analysis, um, sort of put, put forms of thinking in that, that, that make the population very pliant. So, so you have sort of the breakdown of critical thinking. Then right next to that, they would always sort of like raise painful stuff from the 90s, just like a sect breaks down your critical thinking, then says, tell me about your trauma. And so they would, this is not true that Russia completely represses all its traumas. It does talk about the Stalin times. It does talk about uh, the 1990s, but it does it in a way that is not, that would sort of uh, bring some sort of catharsis and bring about a critical language to, to talk about this rationally, but kind of just like massages the pain. Remember the humiliation of the 90s, wasn't it awful? You were poor and depressed. Remember the Stalin times, everyone was always putting us down. So this kind of, sort of emotional manipulation, and then at the end, the big sort of, you know, the big emotional push up, but Putin will save you. And that kind of reached its fruition with, with Crimea as the ultimate kind of moment of, 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 of uh, sort of, you know, lifting people up. It's exactly how a sect works. It breaks down your critical thinking, humiliates you, then raises you up. And the whole TV was kind of based on these things. If I didn't know to what extent the elites talk about this stuff this way, uh, and then people in Russian TV talk about it this way, um, I would think it was a coincidence. I don't think there's someone there planning it, but I think sometimes culture reflects the passions and the interests. Of, of the people who create it. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have myself a con completely conspiratorial view of Russian TV. I don't, I don't think that you can manipulate society, you know, minute three, minute five, evening broadcasts. Society is much more complicated, but that's pretty, that was pretty much their mindset and it became kind of expressed in many things. And the language in society changed. Um, I'm gonna give you, uh, how much more time do I have to do this? Five. five minutes. Okay, I'm gonna give you a little extract of, of um, a guy that I, met towards my stay in Russia because the society was trying to sort of starting to sort of spin out of control um, uh, and sort of like odd odd sort of uh, um, uh, sort of anti-critical anti-rational thinking was happening and so a guy I met was a hell's angel um, I don't know if any of you have been following the news uh, Crimea and the Donbass so among the sort of leaders of the Russian charge into Crimea were these pro-Putin Russian Orthodox hell's angels uh, in the 1990s well, well, and they did their job very well. Uh, so in the 1990s, they were really pro-American and kind of anti-Russian. And then they found God uh, and they found Putin and Surkov f found out about them and he, and he funded them. And they had these huge bike fests where they mix, it's a bizarre mix of kind of heavy metal, uh, praising Putin, praising Stalin. Uh, religion, and it's huge, they're huge. I mean, these concerts for hundreds of thousands of people. And, and it's, it's just the way they talk about stuff and the way this guy talked about what he believed in was really a reflection of the way language has become in Russia. So I'm, I'm at his, you know, a guy called Alexei Weiss. He's a political technologist during the day. Literally, he works for a political party and he's a hell's angel at night and he's this religious nationalist nutcase. You're headed to, this, I, I was having a conversation with him. This is him kind of lecturing me. You're headed to death, Peter. We're all headed to death. That's the first thing I would make them realize. He's talking about the audience. That's the thing about us bikers. We live with death every day. We're a death cult. We know where, go, you know, we know where we're going. Russia is the last bastion of true religion, continues Weitz. Stanislavski used to say, either you're for art or art is for you. That is the difference between the West and Russia. You're imperialist. You think all art is for you and we think we are all for art. We give, you take. That is why we can have Stalin and God together. We can fit everything inside of us. Ukrainians and Georgians and Germans, Estonians and Lithuanians. The West wipes out small peoples. Inside Russia, they flourish. You want everything to be like you. The West has been sending us its influence of corruption. A Russian who is trained in a Western company starts to think differently. Self-love is at the root of Western rationality. That is not our way. You have been sending us your consumer culture. I don't think of Washington or London as in charge. Satan commands them. You have to learn to see the holy war underneath the everyday. Democracy is a fallen state. To split left and right is to divide. In the kingdom of God there is only above and below. All is one, which is why the Russian soul is holy. It can unite everything. Like an icon, Stalin and God. Like every Everything you see here, we're in a place, a very weird place, in the night worlds. We take bits of broken machinery and mold them together. He stops for a moment. I must have been looking at him strangely. My goblet of tea held in midair. The switch from Stanislavski to the kingdom of God had happened so smoothly that I didn't have time to readjust my face. <laughs> or at least I'm trying to piece everything together, Veit says more quietly. It's a work in progress. Maybe we won't be able to manage it. So what I'm trying to 
get out of the book um, is, is that just as the television manipulation pushed towards an irrational language, there's also inside the ideology a sort of a madness implicit inside of it. So if you take sort of Alyona or Surkov's um, attitude to life, where everything is play, where everything is endless transformation, at one point that just starts to sort of spin out of control. Uh, and that's, I think, when Merkel says that you know, Putin's living inside his own reality, I think that's essentially what's happened. So they go side and side. It's a chicken and egg thing. What comes first? The mentality which created the form of political control, the political control that creates the sort of this ideology. They feed each other and they're both sort of spinning out of control. Um, I'll leave this on a, on, a, on a small note because the book actually ends with me returning to the West, I'm returning to London and to a certain extent America. Um, and it's sort of, um, somebody said, your book is, is planned in the same way as Planet of the Apes. I'm not saying that Russia is like apes. That's not what I meant. What I mean is that I come back uh, and I realize that actually, oh my God, some of the problems that Russia is dealing with and where it's pushed itself into actually echoes, echoes with our own society. Uh, Russia might actually not so much be a freak show, but actually a sort of a, a sort of, um, I don't know, a, a very radical reflection of something that's happening in the West as well. Um, we, I'll take a concrete example. So Russia today, which is sort of the propaganda arm of Russia, has sort of launched in America and Britain, and it's actually built around this same ideology. So their ideology is there is no such thing as objective truth. Talk to them a bit more, there is no such thing as truth. Uh, there is no, um, uh, and all truths are sort of equal. So, so, so thus you can have conspiracy theories on your TV uh, as, as your news. Thus you can sort of, uh, um, thus you can take a neo-Nazi and say, oh, his opinion is just as important as anybody else's opinion. Um, and, and this resonates very, very strongly uh, among especially my generation who've been sort of brought up with, with I think, it, originally a very sort of benevolent sort of uh, postmodern vision that there is no such thing as objective truth, that all opinions are kind of uh, just, as, uh, just as kind of uh, uh, just as equal as the others. Um, and this echoes very, very interestingly with, with the stuff that I heard in Russia. And Russia has kind of like become a, a massive thing. But when it pushes up against the West, when we see sort of the Russian information war uh, trying to project itself onto the West, it finds a very, very welcome audience at a very deep level. Uh, superficially, nobody likes Putin. That's not the point. But what they kind of feed is this sort of uh, endless relativism and cynicism within our own societies. And I'll leave it at that. I know that sounds very amorphous, but there's a lot of that in the book. Uh, I just wanted to make, to, to make you feel that it's not just about Russia, the book. Uh, the trick of the book is that kind of shines, uses Russia to shine a light back onto, back onto us. Um, that last bit was very, very woolly, but that's because I'm tired and it's time for you to ask me some questions. Yeah. I, I have a quick question. Um, where, where does this, what, what's the end point or end game for Russia in your opinion? Okay, so this, the end game was, was, was around a, a, a Russian, I actually asked this in the book, and uh, I go, oh my God, is Russia heading towards disaster? He's like, no, 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 we are already in, we are on the sticks. The disaster was then. Everything that happens now in Russia and in Europe is already a, a kind of a, a, shadow, a shadow game. This is, all, this is all, I guess this is all from the kingdom of the dead. Uh, the, the disaster happened then, and the question is, can it have a rebirth? But this is all still aftershocks of that, of that great disaster, um, of the Stalin period and, and the communist period. So, so, so um, I hope anyway, because you know, if the great disaster is still to come, that's even worse. But I think this is all, this is all sort of, uh, you know, the the agonies and the games of a society in 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 a sort of you know hell, basically. So. I don't know if that answers your question. I just ask a character, and that's what he tells me in the book. Thank you. Um, I have a general question and then a concrete context. Uh, first, are you describing all Russia or uh, particularly urban Moscow, maybe a couple of other cities phenomenon? And the companion question is sort of, uh, uh, you seem to be saying that uh, they don't believe what they hear, and yet uh, I'm very concerned about Ukraine, and we hear all the ridiculous things that the media is saying about Ukraine, but it appears that the population believes them. Uh, no, so, so, uh, so the book is, so the privilege of my work in Russia was that I worked for Russian TV channels and my brief was to make people across the country laugh and cry. I had to make mm -hmm. 
ratings winning television for normal Russians. So I knew my audience very well. Um, so the book is very much about the whole of Russia. Partly because that was my job, and those are the films. Mm-hmm. The films I was making was for them, not for here. And that was my journey into the society. Also, it's structured uh, in a way that I do kind of this journey around. So it's, it's, my, it's my life. So I was based in Moscow, and I knew TV producers who were kind of the intellectual elites. But all the shows we were making, you know, my brief was always make shows that will make a woman, a single mother in Urupinsk was always used, <laughs> uh, entertained. And those are the people, those are the heroes of my shows. So I think in that sense, I, I, I don't fall into that trap of just doing it about Moscow. But it is very honest. It is, it is me. I don't try to make any sort of sociological uh, formula. Uh, but that's kind of my unique insights in working in there. So the, the, the attitudes towards the media. Um, so this is the thing. If you don't believe, if you think everything's a con, yeah, if you don't believe what anyone says, it's very easy to manipulate you. Because what the Russian media says is like, Maidan, not real. Actually, some hidden hand was behind it. That's why conspiracy works very well for cynics. There was a lovely, um, uh, there was a lovely um, uh, research on by Northeastern University and said that people who listen to alternative news sites are actually far more likely to swallow disinformation. <laughs> so it's like, Maidan, don't believe what you see. It's actually the evil CIA people. So Russians don't believe Putin, but they do believe that there is someone evil doing some evil conspiracy somewhere. Plus, conspiracy is used all the time. So the end point of cynicism is actually conspiracy and paranoia. It's kind of amorphous all the time. So people who don't believe in anything are actually very, very easy to manipulate. <laughs> yeah. Um, after the end of the Soviet Union, um, I remember reading and uh, hearing about uh, old communists complaining about or thinking about the talking about the times when they knew what to expect. They had a little health care, a little food, etc. Tomorrow was going to be like today and yesterday. Predictability about their future. We in the West also knew what Russia was going to do. We knew that they would invade maybe, you know, Czechoslovakia or Hungary, but they would not start a world war. Mm. We knew what kind of, that they were not crazy. Now, my question is, the, the people, the masses, those who don't play the game, what do they think about their life tomorrow? And, and is Russia becoming an unpredictable country, and therefore a dangerous country. It's not, I mean, I'd be very careful with this madness stuff. So listen, whenever a, have you ever heard of something called reflexive control? Okay, this is an obsession among uh, uh, Russian military and intelligence thinkers. So this is their key idea when it comes to um, information war. So our idea of information war is, you know, go to Afghanistan and make the Afghans like us by giving them, I don't know, reality shows and Coca-Cola or something. So the main Russian idea of, of, of information war is something called reflexive control, where you get inside the thinking of the opposition and make them do things that you want them to do. So I'm just talking about this in context of madness and Russia's mad, po- mad politics. So there is a madness implicit in the system, which is I look at here a lot. But I'd be very careful about Putin playing the madness card. This is being used very, very vociferously and very, very... I think a lot within relations with Washington. So basically, a friend of mine, senior journalist, um, and think tank guy, goes to Moscow recently. All his sources, who are kind of like elites around Putin, are saying, Putin's gone mad, absolutely mad, unpredictable, crazy. What you have to do is stop the sanctions. The sanctions are making things much worse here. So it's like, oh, okay. So be very, very careful. There's, he's, he's, he's mad, but he's a lot less mad than he's making out. So madness is being used as another kind of like game. Um, no, I, th- I think they're, pr- I don't think they've reached the point of suicide mad, uh, self-inflicted damage mad. That's what we're talking about, yeah? No, they're greedy cowards who are playing you. But there is a madness and a self-destruction implicit in the system. Russia is the world champion at suicide, socially. I mean, gulag. They didn't do it to others, they did it to themselves. The great risk, it goes into some sort of self-destruct spiral. That's, that's what everybody inside of Russia that I know is very worried about, that it's some kind of... We're talking about Eris and Thanatos rather than um, policy. So there is something very wrong in the head, but I don't think it's, it's going to express itself in sort of tanks rolling into Budapest. Why not? 
Well, because they just, you know, they want to stay in power and have fun for the moment. I mean, they're not, they're not, they might eat each other up. Then why would they do that? I, mean, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I just don't see it at the moment. I wouldn't bet. I well, would. neither would I. <laughs> I'm not a betting man, but that just doesn't seem the game to be the game they're playing. This guy's yeah. next, I think. Very general yeah. question, which you've covered to some extent already, but what do you see as the end game here? Where is the government going? Do they, if they cannot control the media indefinitely? They're not going anywhere. They're just improvising on the spot, from what I can tell. I don't think there is a grand master plan. And we keep on coming back to this with Putin. He's not a great strategist. He's a tactician. They, they, they do this. They're very good at operations. They do this. They do that. That keeps them in power. That gets them this. Um, they are on an aggressive expansionist line. I mean, that's the narrative within the country. That, that you know, the, the gentleman who left, I, I think there is... There is, of course, a danger in the logic that once you start a militaristic sort of uh, um, narrative inside the country, you kind of topple into it. Stories define you sometimes. Uh, so there is always a risk of that. Um, but th they seem to be just improvising, going around in circles, and, and thus it's very, very self-destructive. I mean, no, there is no economic policy anymore. I mean, it just doesn't exist. Talking about predictability, um, the Russian deputy prime minister who has a think tank, uh, a hedge fund on the side in Moscow, which is run by British people, I won't say which one, um, uh, used to be also always give them hot tips. So it's like, okay, we're going to do this, short this, long this. It was a game. Now he goes and says, I don't know what the economic policy is. So this happens when you have no strategy. Um, but yeah. yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, my question would be, don't you think that the things Russia is doing are coming out from the Russian identity? For instance, uh, Kyiv is a kind of mother of Russian cities, so Ukraine is a kind of Kosovo for Russia in this way. Or if Russian media are saying that uh, Ukraine is ruled by Nazis and there is a genocide of Russian-speaking people, and we know that Russian or Russian identity modified by Soviets has a very strong ground on fighting against Nazis. And therefore, those things have a very big inertia, and they probably cannot be undone. Can you comment on that? Um, yes, but it's, I mean, it's, let me actually re-answer the last question, and maybe, maybe, maybe it'll help with this one. I mean, when I say Russia has no strategy, um, no, it, ha it has c clearly several priorities, yeah? I mean, one is to turn the EU to mush, to humiliate the US by showing that Article 5 is a joke, uh, showing the world that NATO is a joke. These, these are all things. I don't think they add up to a strategy. They, they end up to a sort of, uh, sort of a checklist of stuff they want to achieve. Uh, uh, it's not a strategy in the sense of uh, this is where we want the country to be in 20 years' time. Sorry, I just wanted to... It's always you want to finish the last question. Uh, I, I, I don't really... Essential Russian souls. I mean, er everything that I, that I saw... And everything the book is about is, is how that, that, that's kind of used uh, all the time. So, so um, uh, what I s is it the Russian condition in some way? Oh, I don't know. Oh, God. Um, I, I'm very, very reluctant to make kind of sort of deterministic sort of, you know, reductive ideas about the, the Russian soul and, uh, and all this stuff. Um, uh, I saw it being manipulated a lot. I saw that being used a lot. Uh, I saw that being played on. Um, uh, I, 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 I think it could be played on in a different way and we'd have a different result, basically. I, I don't think... Look, when Russians come to Britain, they become really good Brits. When Russians come to the US, they become, like, within one generation, they're really good Americans. There's, there's some essentialist Russian... What about soul. Deutsch Russen? So is it a different case? What do you mean? The uh, immigrants from Soviet Union to Germany who didn't integrate and many of them didn't even learn German. No, it's a terrible language. Why would you like that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love German. Ich spreche sehr gut Deutsch. No, um, I, I don't know. We, we, I'd, I'd love to discuss that more. But, but generally, what we see is, as soon as Russians are put in a different uh, social condition, look, I'm from Kiev. I consider myself Russian. You go to meet Russians in Kiev. They're Russians. They're the same Russians. They already think differently because they've had 20 years of rubbish democracy, but kind of democracy. So, no, I just, I just don't buy this Russian soul stuff. I think the Russian soul... There's a PhD to write about Russian soul and its misuses. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if that helped. Sorry. I was, I was reading Christopher Hitchens' book on George Orwell over the holiday, and it certainly sounds like the Ministry of Truth is in full operation. Uh, do some cultural institutions in Russia, like the great ballet companies, get co-opted and all this? 
or uh, should I still take my pal to see the Bolshoi Ballet? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I mean, I don't know if you've been following what's been going on at the Bolshoi. I mean, it's, 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 it's an expression. I mean, you, you know, there's like massive corruption, infighting, you know, corruption and uh, battles ideologically. Somebody wanted to make it more Western. Somebody wanted to keep it more conservative. They threw acid in his face and... You know, they sell ballerinas as sex toys. I mean, it's it's it's. A friend of mine's working on a book about the Bolshoi as a kind of uh, a metonymy of, of of Russian history. So definitely, yeah. You've got other Russian companies too. Yeah, no, no I, I I wouldn't. You know, I, this whole cultural sanctions thing. You know, it's 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 such a the evil the evil in Russia is so nuanced that I I you end up becoming a little bit Sokovian in the sense that I don't think one can be like. I will ban all Russian ballet and all Russian singers. And listen, I'll even go to a, a concert by this, this horrible carrier, Putin's carrier, what's his name? There's this conductor. Gergiev. I mean, the man is a carrier. The man is awful, awful, awful. He does the best mahler in the world. Damn it, I'm going to go. Yeah. <laughs> I'll protest. I'll go, awful, you're a horrible person. Then I'll listen. Have uh, gays in Russia been relegated to invisibility or do you see them in the media? Can you comment on that? Okay, so this is how, this is, I think is actually, I don't have it in the book, but I think this is one of the best examples of just how cynical the elites are. Um, so the anti-gay campaign in Russia is being run by, by people, people who are either bisexual or homosexual. So Vecheslav Volodin, probably, Konstantin Ernst, definitely head of Channel One. Uh, a lot of the key producers and heads of, and sort of presenters on Channel One are, are semi-openly gay in, in, in the Moscow party scene, as in you'll see them with their boyfriends. So, of course they have wives. That's the extent to, of, of the cynicism. So we need an enemy, can't really be Jews, can't really be black people or, 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 or sort of dark-skinned people because that's a huge issue in Russia. Gays, no one defends them. Let's choose gays as the enemy. It's, I think it's awful, actually awful, 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 awful being gay at the moment in Russia. It was always very tough, but not because of some kind of deep orthodox ideology. So if anything is closest to the prison ideology uh, in Russia, the closest thing Russia has to a code is the prison code. And in the prison code, um, uh, passive gays were the lowest. So, so it's, it's kind of it's almost from that, oh, you're a passive, you know, it's like that. So that was always present in the culture. Um, I think it's an absolutely dreadful time to be gay. And, and um, I don't know, there's a lot of people writing about this. But one has to understand to what extent it was like, we need a victim, let's choose them. Uh, rather than a, a deep sort of care about families or, 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 or you know, whatever. It was, it was just a convenient victim. Last question. I was wondering if hopefully maybe to end on a hopeful note if you have some ideas of um how this type of information war can be counteracted and i'm thinking in particular what can ukraine do on its part given that this type of thing is leading to inflow of fighters into its territory and death and yeah. an outright war i don't know if you've seen the news ukraine yesterday created a ministry of information which is um pr profoundly misguided but what what is the country to do i, I in love this situation? getting the communications wrong about setting up your ministry of information i mean it kind of proves that you need one i mean it's just like it's just such a mess. I mean, it's like a friend of mine put it well. Things I expect what they do need is a strategic communication center. They really do need to get their messaging right. But they go and get their messaging wrong on getting their messaging right. It's just for fuck's sake. So uh, a friend of mine said, uh, very Max Seddon, who works for BuzzFeed, said, if you want to do something right, don't let the Ukrainian government do that. Um, uh, I actually have a large report that I co-authored recently, a think tank report about various ways to counter Russian disinformation and propaganda. I mean, the first... It's a very, there's two threats. I mean, Ukraine is a very different position to here. I think here we can do it very, very easily through various public information campaigns, maybe some sort of, um, uh, uh, sort of a transparency international for disinformation that would start rating organizations, F Fox and RT, you know, and start giving them marks. Uh, but that's, that's for us where it's a milder problem, where it's, it's, it's deep, it's alarming, but it's, not, it's, it's clearly not a, a sort of a, a burning issue for Ukraine. I think they were right. It, I hate, I'm really glad I'm not the one to do it, but I think they were right to switch off Russian channels. Look, the Ru Russian military thinking thinks of media as a weapon. It doesn't think of it as uh, a propaganda tool to persuade, to charm, to seduce, to spin. It's, it's, it talks about it as a weapon to demoralize, sabotage, divide and conquer. That's what it is. We have this bizarre uh, condition where, where in the 20th century, the great struggle was for, uh, against sort of censorship for freedom of information. In the 21st century, the challenge is going to be how do we stop the abuse of freedom of information? So it's as if the Kremlin couldn't deal with freedom of information by trying to jam it. 
as they did in the 20th century. In the 21st century, they're just going to trash it by, uh, you know, rendering it, by using freedom of information for completely other aims. And we have to wake up to this. Um, so Ukraine in that way, I guess, is a, is, a, is a guinea pig. I hope it's a guinea pig that will survive the experiment.